So um, the next set of neurotransmitters are called um, the biogenic amines. And um, that probably doesn't mean much to you, but uh, what they are is um, they are all derived from amino acids. Here's an amino acid, tyrosine. And then you make small changes to the amino acid to make the neurotransmitter, okay? So they are about the size of an amino acid, but slightly changed from the amino acids. So the first set that we're going to look at are called the catecholamines. Um, they are all derived from the same amino acid. So don't be surprised that they have similar um, reuptake mechanisms, sometimes similar receptors, sometimes similar breakdown mechanisms, because they all look so similar to one another. Um, so here they are. The biogenic amines is the larger category, and the catecholamines is the subcategory that we're talking about. Okay, so the three that fit together because they're so similar in structure are dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Dopamine, um, and we've all taught we've talked about all three of these in a different context. We've talked about them all three as hormones, but here we're talking about this, them as neurotransmitters. Notice that they're all really similar to tyrosine, and then there really are small differences from one another. Um, especially norepinephrine and epinephrine, those two usually even re um, use the same receptors. So I kind of lump those two together, but let's talk about dopamine first. Dopamine is an interesting neurotransmitter. Um, the terminology that goes with dopamine is usually dopaminergic. Lots of different receptors for dopamine. D1 and D2 are important receptors. Um, dopamine is um, mostly a CNS neurotransmitter when it's used as a neurotransmitter. And here it is right here. It's really your reward and reinforcement neurotransmitter. When you did something evolutionarily like ate food or had sex, your brain would reward you with a chemical that felt like pleasure and gave the message, that was awesome, do that again and frequently. So pleasure, reward, motivation, drive, reinforcement, um, food, sex, drugs. Um, evolutionarily, that's awesome when it is um, pro-survival or pro-species. But of course, if you happen upon an exogenous chemical that taps into that pathway, it will reinforce itself and sort of result in seeking behavior. So there is there are a couple of different portions of the brain. You don't have to remember these. But this portion of the brain right here called the nucleus accumbens it uses dopamine is really, really involved in um, drugs of abuse. Um, and then there's a totally different portion of the brain called the substantia nigra that uses dopamine for a totally different reason. It is involved in um, voluntary motor activity. Um, when that one goes bad, it can result in Parkinson's d d disease. So, um, and then one other little thing about dopamine is um, a release of too much dopamine in certain portions of the brain is one of the characteristics of schizophrenia, which actually has a really strong genetic component. Um, we're going to come back to dopamine as we go through the other notes because some other neurotransmitters will reinforce themselves by causing dopamine release at the same time. So dopamine is a biggie, but I will break it up a little bit and come back to dopamine. Amino acid's a little bit different than an amino acid. Um, still on the catecholamines, those are also sometimes called monoamines. Um, we did dopamine, reward, reinforcement, definitely involved in addiction. And now norepinephrine and epinephrine. Those two I'm going to lump together, although norepinephrine is more often used as a neurotransmitter. And when used as a neurotransmitter, it's more often used in the CNS. In the PNS, it's more often epinephrine, both as a hormone and as a neurotransmitter. Um, as far as the terminology goes, you've already learned this, but let me just reinforce that because we found this as a hormone, epi, uh, as a hormone, and traced it back to the adrenal gland before we found it as a neurotransmitter, all of these, like if this synapse right here involved epi or norepi, we would call the whole synapse adrenergic, and the receptors would be adrenergic and all of that good stuff. Um, so... 
Um, there are a couple of different common kinds of receptors um, for epi and norepi, and they're primarily alpha and beta. And um, we're going to run into them in the cardiovascular system with like beta blockers and things like that. Um, the function of epi and norepi, the CNS function, is it's kind of your up neurotransmitter. It's I'm awake, I'm alert. <clears throat> I've got energy and concentration. Sometimes they call it the arousal neurotransmitter, but not sexual arousal, just like up attention, all that kind of stuff. And then in the PNS, the primary function of norepinephrine is fight or flight, right? It's involved in the fight or flight functionality. Now, again, because these three right here are so similar to one another, all of the catecholamines or monoamines have a similar reuptake and breakdown mechanism. And so this will matter because of the drugs that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, catecholamines, there is a monoamine uptake um, mechanism that occurs at some um, uh, at some synapses. And at other synapses, there's a breakdown mechanism um, with an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. So monoamine oxidase and the monoamine reuptake mechanism kind of work for dopamine, norepinephrine, and um, epinephrine. So as far as the clinical connections go with that, um, some drugs that matter here, um, Wellbutrin, which is called bupropion, um, is a selective norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. And so what it does is it mimics the effect of having nor more norepinephrine and dopamine in the synapse. And so you get a little bit more of this activity and a little bit more of this activity. And so it can be used as an antidepressant. Not good for anxiety, but good in some circumstances for depression. And then there is a drug that is not used very frequently anymore, except in inpatient situations. That's a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, Nardil and Marplan. And those are used for really, really treatment-resistant depressions. And then amphetamines are used for ADHD, among other things, and they increase the amount of monoamines in the synapse. And if you click here, there's a little two-minute video that shows you how amphetamines work for ADHD. So I'm going to stop there, and I'll do the other biogenic amines in the next video.